Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Creative Chat webinar series from Career Girls. This is our fourth and final in this series. And today we're talking about making a living as a creator. Um, my name is Lorena King. I produce events for a large tech company in Silicon Valley. And I'm also the executive director for One to Dream, providing scholarships to deserving college students. But today I'm your MC. I'm your host. I will basically be asking the questions that you have for these amazing role models. Um, so make sure you add them in the chat. Uh, and I will be uh, asking those questions throughout our hour here together. First up, we have Hey One. Uh, she's a senior creator success manager at Patreon. Um, we also have Erica Ng. Ng. She is a film director. And we also have Tiana Harris. She's a digital content producer and strategist. Ladies, welcome to the chat. Hey, Lorena. Hi. And we also want to welcome the girls that are participating, right? Because this is for you. This is so you guys can learn. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching us. Like I said, if you guys have questions, add them in the chats. And for our panelists, if you guys have questions for each other, um, I'm sure we can make this into a, a fun conversation. So just jump in and, and let's get to it. So First up, um, hey, one, what does a senior creator success manager do at Patreon? Uh, we do all of things. At, no, I'm joking. Um, what does a, a creator success manager do at Patreon? Um, so I work um, on a creator facing team. So just so people know, Patreon is a membership platform for creators so they can uh, make a living um, around their art, right? So like um, having content behind a paywall um, that people pledge to and they get like a recurring amount to. So I work on the creator success team where I work directly with creators to help them grow on the platform. Um, it's like a mix of, uh, I like to say like art and science. So um, being able to leverage like data analytics to be creative, right? To optimize like um, the performance of the thing. Uh, so it, it's 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 a a well rounded role that allows me to work with like a slew of creators from like podcasters to video creators um, to musicians. It's pretty fun. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Um, similarly, um, Tiana, what do you do as a content producer and strategist? Well, I actually get to work with Hey Juan. Um, so I am a producer with Easter Ray's production company called Hooray, where we also have a Patreon channel. And Hey Juan is our <laughs> creator success manager. Um, but in my role, I'll say most recently, we had the launch of Insecure um, this Sunday. So we had Insecure Fest and a lot of premier events. So I'm there making sure that our digital social teams are capturing content. I'm overseeing um, the post process. So editing those videos down, creating engaging content, ultimately uploading it to our social channels and then engaging with our fans from there. That sounds awesome. And Erica, I think most of us think we know what a film director does, right? Or, or we try, we think we understand it, but can you tell us and tell our girls um, what the role of the film director is compared to that of the producer, or the cinematographer, or, um, director of photography? Uh, sure. I mean, it's really kind of hard to break down, but usually the producers, there's different kinds of producers, but most likely they're like either creative or logistical. Um, as a director, what I do is kind of create ideas. And so if you have an idea, you need a producer to figure out, okay, so where can you shoot it? How much is it going to cost? Where can I put trucks and how can I load in equipment? Um, and the cinematographer is the kind of person that shoots it. So I collaborate with all what's called heads of department. So I'll have my role where it's like a key creative role. And then I'll talk to my heads of department in camera, in art. Um, sometimes I'll talk to the gaffer or the other camera operators or like the wardrobe people. And I'll just kind of coordinate through each department what the vision is. So it's all cohesive. And I work with a producer who's really good at kind of organizing it all logistically. This one's for all of you. What is the, the your favorite part of your job of what you're currently doing right now? I, I mean, so I started off when I was 16 making films. And when I got my first job, I was probably out of college. So my favorite part of being a director now is that I get to kind of control my destiny and my career. 
But before that, I was like working in an office, I was making money, I was learning about the industry, I was meeting people. So I spent years just like working behind a desk and working for people. And I would say I learned the most there, but I think that nothing really tells you how to be a director except for just directing. So it just took me a while to actually trust myself as my own boss. But now that I do, I love it. <laughs> I get to wear sweats to work. Like it doesn't matter. I get to be creative. <laughs> And they still have to listen to me, so that's great. I can go. I still wear sweats to work, and I work at a tech company. Um, my the favorite my favorite part of my job is well, um, a little bit about me. Prior to Patreon, I spent many years as a creator, as a as a musician, songwriting. Actually, um, Erica um, has directed music videos for me, um, and I think like my favorite part of my role today is that I get to be the support system for creators um, that I wish I had when I was a creator. So like leveraging the machine that is a tech company with like expertise, funding, all the things, being able to provide that to creators who have a dream, the same dream that I had, um, and like being the strategist that empowers them. Like it's very, very rewarding. Yeah. Um, I think similarly to Erica, for me, it's just about like having an idea. And then um, I'm also a producer. So once I have the idea, I'm coordinating all the budgets and the crew and stuff like that. And then going out and making it. And the best feeling is when it's like out in the world. And then you get that one comment that says like, yo, this is dope. Or like someone chimes in with the sentiment that you wanted them to have. You only need one person and it's like super rewarding. That's awesome. And Tiana, you've managed the digital presences for BT, for Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud, Netflix, and Lionsgate properties. Can you tell me how it's different to manage the digital presence of a big company like Netflix or BT to something more specific like a show? Yeah, so when working for brand versus like programming, um, you just have the reputation of the brand like at your hands or at your fingertips. So you have to exercise like a huge amount, a huge amount of discretion. Um, there's also just massive amounts of red tape of what you can say, what you can't say. You typically get these Bibles of like what the emojis you can use are, what the hashtags you can use are, which topics you stay away from. You get lots of chiming in from legal. Um, and then working on like the programming side, it's way more fun because you have a show that's in market. You typically have maybe like 12 weeks to just like, go all in on that show so you get to create gifts and memes around the characters again engaging with the fans of those shows um it's just a lot more creative and um less restrictive i can totally see that where a, a big company would have a lot of definite you know rules to to keep their name safe i suppose um okay this next one i have uh doo -doo -doo. It's, this one's for everybody. So what role does social media play in your work? And I, um, you know, I imagine for, for Tiana, for you especially, it's probably, you know, huge, right? But I think uh, social media for everybody is, 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 you know, plays a big role. Um, but what role does it play? I can go. Um, so for, so Patreon is a membership platform, right? Um, essentially, it's like the space where your super fans live, right? So social media platforms house the communities of creators, right? So my job is to, to help my creators convert their communities from various platforms to Patreon. So having an understanding of social is really important. Understanding content, uh, digital marketing, generally speaking, uh, so yeah, that's like a really big piece of my day-to-day -day with my creators. Um, it's kind of, that's a hard question for directors, but I think like all artists are on social media at some, in some shape, way or form. Um, I think it's really important to have your portfolio out there to see so people can follow you. Um, I think for directors and artists specifically, it does really help to have a little bit of like just posting your work, uh, whether it's like screenshots of your work or clips of your work, talking about your work, BTS, just anything to show you on set. Um, for some reason, it legitimizes you. I don't know why. Like there are some directors that don't do it and that don't even have websites that get work. But I think like 
if you are a creative person and you're looking to have a creative career where you have to have a portfolio, it's always good to have a really clear website and also have, make sure you have like a social media site because some people do find me on Instagram and that's kind of the new way of networking. Like back in my day, we had business cards and now no one, got, no one uses business cards anymore. So when I go to film festivals, like what's your at? Like, like, where are you on Instagram? So I make sure that my little at has like stuff that I do. So it, I look legitimate basically. Absolutely. I'm looking at some of the questions um, I have here. How did they get their start? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> Um, I got my start in an internship program called the Emma Bowen Foundation. Um, and so like my senior year of high school, I got matched with an internship at Comcast, actually, um, where I was working in like regional corporate communications, um, creating like briefs and decks for like whatever the new corporate initiative was. Um, and then that was like my first start in like media and entertainment. From there, I just had a bunch of internships while I was in college at Howard University, um, and I would say I got my like start in social media, television, um, marketing is when I was actually interning for American Express. They had a partnership with a radio station. And um, one of the execs would walk past my desk every day and I would speak to them. Um, we built a rapport. And then one day they couldn't like go cover an event. And they were like, you're young. Can you go cover this event for me? And then I covered the event. They liked my work. Um, and that just kind of like set me down this path of doing like social media marketing for um, television and film. Uh, my career has kind of been one of those. Um, so I started out uh, at a tech company working in marketing, um, but more like on the analytics side. Uh, I was like competent, but not necessarily passionate about it. So I was like, this doesn't feel right. So like I 180'd. And I said, I'm quitting tech. I'm going to go be a songwriter in LA. So I moved from the Bay to LA. Um, and I did that for many, many years where it gave me like this rich lens um, into self. Like I really got to discover like what I, like what activated me and invigorated me. And that kind of became the compass for the decisions I made, right? So it's like songwriter and I like created and collaborated with so many uh, creatives. And then as I was doing it, I knew it wasn't necessarily like my end point. Like I knew there was something else. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I had to do things that were creative, that embedded me in community um, and, and provided for some like freedom, right? Uh, so then I went from like creator to digital marketer at an indie record label. And I was like, oh, this feels a bit more like me. Um, and did that for a little bit, uh, consulting emerging artists and helping them grow, right? And then um, for, from there, I, I wanted to kind of like get back into tech, like the intersection of tech, but then like arts, the like creativity, right? Hence Patreon, um, which I've been doing for the last year. And it essentially like has kind of given the context to everything I've gone through over the last handful of years. It like ha having lived the life of a creator, also as someone who's been in tech and, and analytics, it's like the perfect like space for me, right? So the silver lining or like the, the lesson from all of this is like, you don't always have to know where you're going. You just have to be like guided by things that like feel good, right? So having a sense of self is very important as you like go from um, stage to stage. Uh, so that's how I kind of landed at Patreon. Nice. And I, um, so I started filmmaking when I was 15, 16. So I kind of like that we're talking to young people today and people in school still, because I was still in school when I, um, when my teacher was like, oh, you should learn filmmaking because I wanted to be in animation. And I didn't like school. I wasn't good at it. <laughs> I liked watching TV all day and I liked anything visual. And so my teacher, he knew I did photography. He knew I liked animation and said, oh, you should learn film. So when I got an internship, when I was like in high school, I learned like cameras and I saw like the editing software and I just like became obsessed with it. And um, I just knew that's something I really wanted to do. So later on, I got an after school program for, um, I was one of like the directors there. I was um, a kid that kind of like took uh, my other friends like, hey, let's learn film together. We get paid after school. So we made our little films together and my mentor was like, oh, you should you know, try to actually be a director. And he kind of guided me through my first film because I have no idea how to make one. 
So when I made my first film and I got into festivals and I won like $5,000 as a kid um, through festivals, I was like, okay, now I'm a director now, I make money and I can do this forever. And so I used that money and I bought camera gear and I started choosing music videos because I wanted to be a music video director. Like I grew up on hip hop music videos, R&B music videos, Missy Elliott um, and ludicrous music videos. So that's all I wanted to do. I just want to like film musicians <laughs> and rappers in the Bay Area. So I um, went to school for cinematography and directing and just like made my videos on the side. Like I had my camera, so I was out there shooting concerts, like hip hop shows, making like music video MTV documentary type stuff, you know, with like my friends. And so when I moved down to LA after graduation, I had like a little bit of a reel and some videos together and I knew nobody. I went to a city, I had no, no one. I got an internship at um, a feature film company and it was like really stuffy and dry and cubicles and they talk about films, but they don't make films. And I was like, this is boring. And so I discovered a music video company that was like with Dave Myers and Joseph Kahn. I was like on Chris Brown music video sets. I was like, okay, this is what I wanna do. Like, I wanna be like where the cool kids are and be on set with everybody. And so I kind of moved my way through the film industry, through commercials and music videos and learned the industry through being an assistant, being a PA. So I took the safe route of having a job. When I moved down here in 2008, I was a PA, but I took like an assistant job in 2009. And I worked from like production company to agency, working with a feature film director. And um, I was just too scared to branch out on my own because I didn't know how to be a freelancer. Like I was making constant money. I had time on my nights and weekends to shoot and do my own thing. Um, but it took me a really long time to be like, okay, now I'm ready to go on my own because no one really tells you how to make money as a, as a director or as a creative. So this is why the panel is so good because I mean, I think I came from a very safe, like career path of like having a job first and having a savings. And then eventually I was able to make money as a director, but I'll tell you, it took me 10 years. So it's a really, really long path to, to actually get there. I think I'm going to have a lot of follow-up questions, but what I liked about each of your answers is that all three of you have a completely different, like took a completely different path, right? And I think it's important for young girls to know that if you know what you want to do, dive in, right? Like, and get immersed into what you want to do. But if you don't, it's also okay. Like Heywin was saying, like explore what feels good. And that is going to eventually lead you to do something that maybe it's a career that you are completely unaware of, but that is going to fill your heart and fill your soul. So I think it's really important to, you know, be okay with whatever it is that, that you know right now and, and whatever it is that you think your career will be. Because um, even when you know exactly what you want to do, you're going to have to take, you know, a bunch of it's not a straight line, right? It's, you're going to have some turns and some, you're going to have to go backwards sometimes. And um, I think Erica, something very important that you mentioned is that, you know, you took some of those jobs as a, as a PA, as production assistant, when you are also directing. So, you know, it's not always, you know, I graduated from film school and I have, uh, I've directed all these short films and all I want to do is direct. Well, it's not, maybe it's not gonna be a straight path to always directing, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of taking those jobs? And then also Tiana, after that, I wanna hear a little bit more of internships and if it, it, um, Erica and Haywan, if you guys have any um, internship uh, stories, also uh, talk to us a little bit about that. And I'm interested to know about like paid internships, unpaid internships, internships for credit and the importance of maybe just doing some volunteer work to to you know work on your reels or work on your on your creative right I mean my internships actually was after college because I don't know why again I'm really awful at school I don't think I understood what internships were <laughs> and so I did an internship after I graduated because I, I I finished like so now what do I do I want to be in film and then my professor actually helped me get an internship that was an unpaid internship at a production company that's where the the one that did music videos and commercials um and um i also worked at first fly glass entertainment and they did like leap year and some like rom-com stuff and um I, I i just learned as much as i could through these internships and they're all unpaid 
I don't know that people get paid for stuff because in film you don't, <laughs> but now I guess you're, you do because they have to pay PAs now. But when I was starting out, there weren't any paid internships. There's nothing, you, you barely got paid as a PA. Um, I think filmmaking is like a really, it's a hard career where you lose a lot of money, but you have to risk your, a lot of things to, to actually, you know, make a career out of it. But it kind of comes from having like a safety net whether it's like you have a savings, you have a way of making money, whether you have a day job at like at a cafe at Starbucks or something, like you have to have a job because filmmaking is a career where you lose money constantly. <laughs> you lose money going to drinks, you lose money going to lunches and talking to people, or you lose money by like not getting paid on jobs. But what you do gain is experience in connections and people. Like people wanna work with someone who's very eager, who has no ego that will pick up the trash when they're asked and they'll lock up location and never see set. So the first jobs you'll ever have are the ones that I had on set were like, I never saw set. I was picking up trash. I was like cleaning up desks. I was filling up the printers, but I was happy to be there. So you just want to be that person who's happy to be there with no ego. Even if like I was, um, when, I, when I was working for six years in the office, I was like overseeing production teams. So when I left, I had to figure out how to go back to freelance. So I went back to being a PA. So I was again, picking up trash and like, or getting coffee or like cleaning desks again, because I just had to make money to understand how to become a freelancer. So it's just that, that road is so long, but just know that you just can't have an ego and you have to take any job just to learn and just meet people. Cause they all like to meet, people want to work with people who are just eager to be there. And unfortunately it means for free sometimes. I, I had some internships in college. Um, I started out in tech. So a lot of my internships were in tech. Um, they were paid internships. I actually um, was in a program called Inroads, um, which is a program for um, college students of color, uh, applied to that and then um, had tech internships do that. So I knew I wanted at least like one to two years of internship experience prior to graduation to set me up for a job um, when I graduated. Um, and those internships did that. It was, I had a few job offers uh, when I graduated, ended up going to a tech company called Cisco. Um, so yeah, internships are extremely important. However, um, like the experience is important. The pay piece is, is lovely, right? Um, but to Erica's point, if it's not a paid internship, like understanding what you're learning from the experience, if unpaid, is very important. If it's serving you and serving a purpose, um, then it's worth, worth taking on, right? When there's a point where it's no longer serving you, then that's when you decide, do I move on from it, right? So each opportunity, like that's why it's important to know where you're headed, right? So I'm gonna take this unpaid internship because I know I need to learn, gather experience as a social media manager, I don't know. Whatever the experience is, let me do this for X amount of time, gather that experience that I then can leverage into the next thing, right? So having that vision of where you're headed is, is helpful when taking um, opportunities that aren't necessarily paid. Um, also the community piece and network, right? Like the people you meet while being um, at your internship will like serve you in the future. Um, it might be two, three, five years from that internship, but holding on to those uh, relationships is really important too. Um, for me in college, internships were how I like survived in college because I didn't have um, like a full ride. There was no like help from mom. So I was doing it on my own and internships were a great way for a check. Um, and so I interned during the semester at all kinds of different like agencies. Um, again, like the Emma Vaughn Foundation, I just looked it up. Their applications are actually open there. They were an amazing program because all the money that I made during my internship in the summertime, they would match with a scholarship. So that was like super helpful. Um, I got book scholarships. Um, the internships will be great because if you do good work, they want you back. Um, when your internship is over, if you do great work, they're recommending you for additional work. And so um, when I was interning at like BET, after the event was over, right, it's like, you're a hard worker. What are you doing? I'm invested in your success. And like Iwan was saying, um, you just 
leverage those relationships. You keep in touch with people. You send holiday cards. You send thinking of you cards. Email those people articles like, hey, we once had a conversation about X, Y, Z. And that's how you can stay in touch with them um, because ultimately you want to continue to prove yourself as a resource to them, not someone who's just looking to receive something. And then Erica keeps saying something that I, I just keep nodding my head to, saving your money. Like staying down and saying, I'm going to work for this summer. I'm not going to have as much fun. I'm not going to buy the things because having a savings will allow you to walk away from a job because you will have to walk away at some point because like hey, Juan is saying, you will grow to a point where the money is not enough to keep you because you're passionate about whatever you're looking to grow into. Um, so having a savings will allow you to confidently walk away from that. Absolutely. And I think you just kind of segued into a really important point where it's important for women and girls to know their worth, to know that your work is should not be always free, right? And it's important also to know the balance between you're getting experience, you're building uh, your resume, you are building your reel, and you're building relationships. I know all three of you kept mentioning relationships and, and how that is something it's, that's um, like you can't put a dollar sign to the connections that you make with the people that you work with, who the, to, with the people that have seen the kind of work you do and the kind of um, dedication you have towards your craft, right? So know your worth, but also, you know, understand the importance of getting um, all of that experience that comes with it, with internships. Um, I have other questions over here from, from the list, from the girls. Uh, how do you actually get contracts? Do do they do them or do you have an agent or a lawyer or a manager? And I'm thinking this might be more probably for the creatives um, and, and um, then, then the, then marketing. I. But yeah. So if you're doing, when I was doing my own little production company, with my camera, um, I would make a contract myself and I would ask for templates. And um, I asked people, around who are freelancers, even in graphic arts, um, what their templates look like. Cause I have an older sister that had um, a roommate that was in graphic arts. And so I kind of used hers. Um, that's where I learned what a retainer was. Uh, filmmaking works on a different pay way than I guess normal jobs, which is like by hour. Um, directors don't get paid by hour. That was the first mistake I made. <laughs> Cause my mom tried to help me and she's like, you need an hourly way. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what, what is it? You don't do that. Um, you get paid flat, you get paid flat project fees. So if you are a director or if you work um, like as, a, as an artist, you can, you get paid a flat fee. If you're producing the work, you get a flat sum. So let's say the budget for a music video is 20 grand then you pay yourself out of that 20 grand and you use the rest of it to pay your employees, which is like your cinematographer, your production designer, you know, you, you pay food out of that budget. So that's where you create like your own business. To do that, you need to kind of quit your own contract that you give to the artist and say, okay, this is when the contract is starting. This is how much you're paying me. I want 50% up front and 50 on the back end or 25, 25, 50, whatever you want to do. Um, and I learned contracts through my jobs. So it's another reason why it's good to have jobs is that my first job in the industry, it was at an uh, agency where we represented cinematographers and I knew what their contracts were like, but I also wrote them for three years. So I knew pair play, like you either pay me or um, you pay me a cancellation. Like you can't just cancel and not pay me. So I learned contract language through work. So that's another reason why we're talking about internships or talking about like free work Sometimes it's free, but the knowledge you gain from it is so grand because you can always apply it to your own work. So definitely, um, I mean, if you are a filmmaker, maybe reach out. I can try to see if I can find a template for you. Um, if you're not, then maybe ask someone in your industry for a template and just amend it yourself, but they won't always give you one. Um, if it's for like you're directing a television episode, then they give you a contract. So like, like Sony will give you a contract and they'll go through your managers, but don't think about that just yet. Just wait till later. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Okay, I have another question over here. Um, 
Do you have a favorite campaign, a favorite music video, a favorite project or artist that you've worked with? Um, and you can, can you tell us a little bit about should I, that? Should I mention him? <laughs> him while <I> was like, <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to mention him while, him while By him. the way, I love that the three of you have worked together. <laughs> and like, we're, like we're on this video, it's like not Heywon's video. So I love working with Heywon. Heywon, I, <laughs> I put her through the ringer. Cause like on these kinds of on the music videos, it's like she has to help produce it with me. So she learned how my brain works, and Hey Wan has a very like creative and logistical brain. So um, we did a video strip for me, which was not age appropriate, but I really liked that one. Uh, music video wise, I did a music video for D Smoke years ago called Fighter, and I really liked that one. I basically turned it into a short film where it's about basically like a cinematic portrayal of a world star hip hop fight, and um, it's kind of. Kind of, I wrote it uh, a little bit about growing up in Oakland when like fighting was cool and fun and funny. And um, I don't, I never thought it was. And so it's kind of like playing off of like a world star hip hop fight happening and then something bad happens. So that's my favorite music video that I did. Um, and that went to festivals. And I'm currently in festivals for my short film, Americanized based on growing up in Oakland, playing high school basketball. So narratively that is my, um, my favorite short film that I've done and it's Oscar qualified. So we're applying to the Oscars this year. Yes, amazing. I love it. <laughs> what about uh, Hey Wan, Tiana? Any? I'll, I'll go. Um, aside from working with Erica and Tiana, um, genuinely have um, been amazing um, collaborators. Erica is like one of like the most inspiring creatives that I've got to see like ascend into the entertainment industry. Tiana is like a digital creative mastermind. And I think what her team at Hooray is doing is literally changing the game for the creative industry period. Um, I can talk about a project I'm working on for uh, like at Patreon with some YouTubers. Um, I'm helping some uh, a set of like Gen Zers who uh, primarily operate in the YouTube space uh, produce a podcast. So they came to me and they said, our goal is to diversify our brand and our content, and we want to be the next MTV network. We have an idea. We want to launch a podcast. Can you help us? So it's been like many months in the making, but um, uh, we've been able to provide them with like show development consultations, a, a location, a production uh, uh, team. Uh, being able to like work with them to bring this to life has been super rewarding. Again, leveraging the expertise, the machine that is Patreon to empower creative goals. Uh, yeah, we're like shooting their pilot right now. It's going to be dropping probably later this year. Um, I'll just leave it at that. It is like a very exciting project because it, it allows me to be a creator as well. Right. So like I'm at a tech company, but I'm creating with creators. Um, <clears throat> on my end, it might be some of the stuff I did around like the new edition story, just because it was like my first job. It was the first campaign I got to lead on. And I remember like on January 4th, my first social asset I put out, it went viral. And then we ultimately like won an award for that campaign. And so that's probably like my favorite thing I've ever done because I was like six months out of school when it happened. So that is so awesome. Um, my cheeks are starting to hurt because I'm just listening to you guys and I can't stop smiling. Like, I just, I love hearing how excited you guys are about your careers. And Erica, you did mention Americanize, which is one of my, uh, one of the questions that I had next. Um, congratulations. I know it's, it's already gotten a few awards. Uh, I don't know if you want to show us some of the awards that you have around there. It could inspire some of the girls. Um, but, um, can you tell me how it's different to get, you know, hired uh, to direct a project and then to write and direct something that is so personal that is based on your life and that, and is it hard to put um, part of your story out there for others to, you know, enjoy, judge, uh, and then, you know, once it's out there, it's out there, right? So can yeah. you, can you talk a little bit more about like how that having something so personal be out there um, and then compare it to getting hired to do a job. 
Right. And I'll, I'll add on to that too. I actually wanted to write like an advice thing about like creative careers versus creative hobbies. And I feel like there's a really big difference. I think like, as far as the work that I do in music videos and short films, I love that I have the ability and artists like Haywan trust me that I can create something together with the artist. Of course, it's with the artist's vision and their brand, but I get to kind of take something and make it into something that I love. And that's what I loved about making American Eyes. It was truly my story about myself growing up in Oakland and being Asian American and not really understanding like how to be Asian. Cause I'm fifth generation, I'm very American. And I got to tell my own story. And it was like a very vulnerable thing because I was worried that people in high school would judge me again. <laughs> like the, the film was about being judged in high school. And I was worried even today, like in my mid thirties, like, oh God, I don't want them to see it. I think they're gonna like make fun of me. Um, so it was like very, um, I was really nervous about it, but actually I got some really good responses from people from my high school who were like congratulating me. So I was like, oh my God, you're so mean to me. <laughs> I'm so glad that you like me now. And we're all old and we don't care anymore, you know? So, I mean, things do change as, you know, your, your life goes on. Um, but I say that because I've had, I've luckily had opportunities to make my own things. You don't always get paid to make your art. And I say like music videos, I actually don't get paid really like making a living off of it. I can make enough sometimes, but not wholly. Those are more my creative passion projects and my hobby projects. The work that I do stuff like now, um, I'll do branded or I'll do commercials, but it's not always something that you like. And that's a career. So it's really important that if you are having a career as a director, you don't always direct things that you like to do. Your job is to direct. So if you, I'm doing like a branded thing, actually with a Gen, for, with a Gen Z company um, about this very topic about how to make, you turn your creative passions into a career. And we're talking to like uh, influencers online. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not like a TikToker or a Gen Zer, um, but I, I'm interviewing them to, you know, all day, but it's not something I wrote. It's something I'm being hired to do but I'm happy to do and I find um, passion in making it because I can find little things that I personally connect with. I like talking about business. So I like this project, but it's not mine and it's not creatively mine. I have to talk to creative leads about it. So, you know, when you're doing anything creative, just know that take on work that, that pays you even if you don't like it because <laughs> it's a career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we all can, I mean, probably everybody uh, out there that has a job can relate to, you don't like every single second of your job and, and that is okay. Um, okay, hey Juan, I have one. You started um, your career as a musician. Can you talk a little bit about how that helped, uh, how that part of your life has helped in your current role and then I'm also being asked if you can share any links to your music in the chat. I knew that was coming. Um, but let me answer. That. Yeah, we can do. We can do that. Um, wait, what was the question? I just lost it because that was really funny for me. What was the question? Um, how oh, your how? your music life has helped in your current role? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think. I mean, I spent many years as a songwriter, one being a songwriter, like the thing that you do when you go into studios, like channel your deepest thoughts and feelings, right? So having like that much repetition where I had to like deeply look like inwardly to produce a thing really helped me um, be able to take an idea and like craft it into a thing, right? Also being immersed with like hundreds of creators um, has given me like empathy, right? So when I work with a creator, I'm not coming from the perspective of like this massive big tech company, um, which Patreon is not. We're, our CEO is actually a creator, a musician. His name's Jack Conti. He's amazing. Um, so like having lived the life of a creator, I understand creators. So when I hop on a call with them, I'm very much just like them. Um, Erica, I said, I wear sweats. Like, this is how I look when I go to Tiana knows. Like, I come as myself um, to my creators and um, that enables me to connect with them in a deeper way. And when you have connection with the people you're working with, you, you're able to produce like amazing results, right? So having had that experience as a creator has kind of given me a lens to um, understand my creators so I can service them in like a deeper way.
Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, and you kind of mentioned it when you talked about internships, but where did you go to school? What did you study? And um, well, we already touched on internships. So school uh, and how'd you got there? Um, I went to San Jose State. Um, it's in the Bay Area. Uh, I got there because that's the only school I applied to. <laughs> I see, I wasn't the most assertive in, in high school. Something clicked in college for me. Um, I was like, oh, San Jose State. Actually, I think it was a kid in my, well, like a science class that said he was going to San Jose State. So I was like, okay, I'll go to San Jose State. Literally, it was just like no thought behind it. Went to San Jose State, um, majored in marketing. Um, I think around like sophomore year, had a really difficult class and started to apply myself. So the back half of, of schooling ended up getting like all 4.0s. And I was like, oh, okay, so I can do this. Um, so yeah, marketing and that kind of like got me into tech, tiptoe into tech. And then I'm like, mm, don't know if I like the tech thing. Went to go be a songwriter and then landed at the intersection of tech and create like entertainment today. So I guess it worked out um, just a little bit. Life has a funny way of working out. Um, Tiana, you mentioned Howard University. How was, uh, was that the goal the whole time? Um, was that the dream school? I mean, it's amazing, right? But uh, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I knew I wanted to go to Howard since like fifth grade. Um, I just, Howard was like the only school I really wanted to go to. It was an amazing experience um, being amongst like all black people from around the globe. Um, my major there was in radio, television, and film management. My degree was called like telecommunications. Um, and it was great because I took a lot of film classes, a lot of like policy classes. We had to minor in a business, whether that was business management, entrepreneurship, or economics. I chose business management. Um, so I took a lot of like business law and accounting classes. And I think that those set me up to be business minded in the entertainment space, um, which like, since we're talking about how to make money, you want to know how to like pluses and minus where the money is coming from, percentage just going to taxes. Um, once you get into like the space like Erica, where you have representation, 10, 20, 50, 30% is going out the door to your team before it even hits your account, all of those types of things. Um, so I highly recommend taking a business course or two while you're in school, even if that's not like your focus or what you're passionate about. I love that, that, was, that that's a requirement. I, I didn't know that. I think that is amazing. I, I wish a lot more schools did that. <laughs> I learned that a little the hard way, but I, I went to San Francisco State University. I applied to every film school in the country and did not get into anything. <laughs> I applied to like a 10 schools and I got into like two. I had, I had okay grades and I was in AP classes. I didn't get into anything. So San Francisco was the only school I got into. Um, and I studied cinematography, um, sorry, cinema, and my concentration was in cinematography because they didn't have a good directing course. It was all on like genre. And I was like, well, I want to shoot things. So I'm going to do cinematography. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, talking to people in the industry, whether it's like producers or anybody, they also didn't study film. They studied business. They studied art, English, science, anything. And I think for creative careers, what matters is like how you create your art and make money from your art. So I think that you can go to any school and study what you like. I think business is very smart. I wish I knew more about business. I, that's how I got jobs is just like learning from the job. But yeah, you can still study what you want to do, but still have like a career in directing as long as you just direct. That's the only way to go about that. Absolutely. So now on the other side, what obstacles have you encountered um, through your career uh, and, and how did you, what did you learn from, from those obstacles and how did you overcome them? That's, those are big questions. <laughs> many, many obstacles. Um, I, I would say for me, different right so like I've had like two disparate kind of careers kind of right like I was a creator in the music space um, I'd say the obstacles I faced as a creator um, centered around finding my tribe 
the group of people who are committed to the thing that are going to grind and, and work um, as hard as it takes to get the thing done, right? That was a challenge. Took years, but I found the tribe, right? Erica was one of the people who like went hard for the dream. Um, on the tech side, I would say some of the challenges, um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, it's like having 180 into tech from creator is holding on to the creator mindset that I have, right? Like just because you're in a new space doesn't mean you assimilate to the new space, right? Luckily, I work at a company that's very like creator friendly. Our CEO is a creator. So I don't experience a lot of that. But like holding on to the entrepreneur within a company is really powerful, right? Just because you are in a, a, like a more corporate environment doesn't mean you can't be innovative and creative and scrappy, right? That, that wins. Um, so like, I wouldn't say it's a, a, a challenge. It's just something I'm like very cognizant of ensuring that I hold on to like my superpower in this new season, in this new environment. I'll go real quick. I think the hardest part about in films that no one was hiring me, and I still find that I'm just starting to get hired a lot more as a director, but it's just really hard to get hired. And to get over that, you just have to make your own work. So finding your own work, sourcing other people that need content and just shoot for them. Um, so many obstacles, and I'll say that my biggest takeaway from my time in College at Howard, like if you're looking in the news right now, you'll see that the students are on campus protesting. Um, you just learn that no doesn't mean no, it means ask later, ask a different way, ask someone else. Um, so we could all list any kind of obstacle. It's just about like not letting the obstacle defeat you. It's about like getting yourself together, grab, gathering your things and trying again anyway, because if you're passionate about whatever your path is, it's just like the obstacles actually don't matter. Yeah, absolutely. The The road is bumpy. Like it's nobody who's successful has ever had a smooth ride, um, ride. Um, if you could go back and give your 10 year old or 15 year old self some advice, what would you tell yourself? I got advice early on when I was actually in college. I wanted to move to LA and direct and I was asking my professor how to do it. And he said, it's very hard. So you should go down there as another career, like a cinematographer or an AD or something else. And I think he gave me really poor advice because I don't think that he thought that I can go down to LA and be called a director. And I kind of wish I went with more of a mindset of, I'm just gonna tell people I, I direct. Cause by that time I, I've had like 10 videos under my belt. But I think it took me a lot of confidence to say I'm a director because I held that title so high and I felt like I'd earn it but I was directing and I probably should have said it earlier. So I think that would have helped my confidence uh, starting out the gate a little bit more. I'd go back and tell myself to not strive for perfection. Uh, that was, I think that's, a, that's something that slowed me down in my entrepreneurial pursuit, right? So like listening and working on a song until like it was perfect, it's never perfect, right? It's a, like, a snapshot of, in, of you in a given period of time, right? So I think I'd go back and just ensure that I created, and tech companies call this like an MVP and minimum viable product. Like create the thing and then put it out in the world. When you put it out in the world, it gives you the opportunity to listen, to get feedback, and then to iterate on the thing. And then the next thing you create and put out will be better, right? So like, if you never try, if you never release the thing, you'll, let, you'll never learn and get the opportunity to grow. So I'd go back and just make sure I wasn't as much of a perfectionist and I just like created and, and did all the things so I can kind of accelerate that path of growth. Um, I think I would just, me and my 10 year old self would have a laugh about the fact that I thought I'd be like a news anchor. And like, I grew up on 106 in Park and I just knew that I was gonna go do the news and use that broadcast journalism degree to become free from 106 in Park. Um, so LOL that none of those things exist anymore. Like 106 in Park is not around, so. That is great. Um, okay, 
do you have currently a mentor at work? And can you tell me how mentorship has helped you in your life, if it has? I'm big on mentorship. Um, I have mentors that are strictly about like work and what my work product is. They give me notes in that capacity. But then I have like Black women mentors who I can talk to them about like my experience in the workplace and perception um, in that way. And yeah, mentors are huge because you don't need to make somebody else's mistakes. They're great sounding boards. But then in the workplace, you can have a mentor in the workplace, but then you also want someone who is an advocate and a champion for you. And those are people who you might not have a mentor-mentee relationship with you, but there are people who their power and their voice in the space matters. And having an advocate in the workplace is hugely important because when there are opportunities and conversations happening in rooms that you're not in yet, those are the people speaking up on your behalf in a way that a mentor might only advise you on what to do once you get that opportunity. I'm going to add to that 100%. Um, I have mentors, like unofficial mentors, right? Um, I have a lot of allies, right? So to Tiana's point, they're, whether you're operating in a tech company, like a production company, entertainment, whatever, um, to get some, something done, it requires like influence, right? And sometimes you might not have that influence based on like where you're, the seat that you hold. So having certain individuals who can help um, nudge an idea across the, the finish line is super helpful, right? So knowing who you can go to when you have a question about something, if you have this big idea that you need help getting a team behind, right? Like all of the allies that I've kind of developed within my company and along my creative journey have like been integral to getting things done um, and helping me kind of um, like guiding me along some like challenging decisions. It's been super helpful. And um, filmmaking is tough, but I had mentors when I was really, really young who helped guide me. But um, what I will say is that the people who guide me now are people, are my peers. And I think that so often we think of networking upward and to people who are executives, but we should network laterally because those are the people around you who are gonna like lift you all up and we're all gonna be peers and we're all working together at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. A lot of times we forget that, you know, the people we work with can, you know, we can learn so much from each other too. It's not just about, you know, people who are executives. We do have a question from um, one of the attendees over here. It says, any advice for someone who does not have a lot of work experience in the film? Uh, in the field of film, journalism, creative work, et cetera, but wants to pursue those careers? Yeah, I was answering like, I think that if you don't know how to do something, just try it. Like with film, no one really teaches you how to make it. You just have to make a film. <laughs> I, I started off making films with no dialogue because I didn't know how to write a script. So music videos is perfect for me because I loved music and I love visuals. So I was practicing like how to communicate a story through visuals only through the lyrics of a story of, of a song. And then eventually I moved up. But if you have no experience, just volunteer on sets, look for college kids who like are shooting their thesis films, go on their sets or any kind of set that needs help and just volunteer. And also in the age of like social media, if you are on TikTok, if you're on Instagram, if you're on any social platform and you're creating these pieces of content or art, you are a filmmaker, you are a storyteller, you're already doing it. Um, there's YouTube University where all kinds of publications like Variety and GQ sit with directors and writers and they have them take you through experiences of their, what their like job and their craft is. Um, you can start now and you do it already in social media and people don't understand that now, but you're doing it already. I think not only that, but with the internet at your fingertips, you can literally learn so much. There are so many free resources out there that if you're not doing it, you can start learning, reading about it, and then you can, uh, you know, get your, your, get, get, your hands dirty and start doing what you want to do. 
Um, I have just a quick uh, to close out because we are running out of time, but I have a quick uh, set of rapid fire questions for you guys. Um, and then just yell it out. No need to like go in order or anything. So if you guys want to unmute. Um, drawings or paintings? Paintings. Drawings. Drawings. Books or movies? Movies. Books. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Night owl. Early bird. <laughs> Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Chocolate. Vanilla. <laughs> oh, who are you? <laughs> Obviously not you. <laughs> <laughs> introvert or extrovert? Both. Extrovert. Yeah, both. Introvert. Comedy or mystery? Mystery. Comedy. Comedy. And what's the last thing you ate? Gummies. <laughs> Cheesecake. Salmon. Cheesecake? Ooh. Nice. Ladies, it has been a real pleasure. Uh, I have enjoyed this talk so much. I hope our girls learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. If you guys, um, Erica, I know for a fact that your movie is doing its the rounds. A lot of, you know, due to COVID, a lot of these film festivals are virtual. Mm -hmm. So where can people go to see where uh, your movie is gonna be playing? Awesome, it's in the chat, so check it out. And then hey one and Tiana, do you guys have anything uh, to you know share with the girls? Uh, hey one, I know they asked about your music or <laughs> yeah, hey one music. <laughs> Those are my socials. You'll find my music. Check it out. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, thanks, career girls. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.